Good morning. It's good to see all of you here this morning on a rather beautiful snowy morning. I know those words perhaps don't always go together in our minds, but it is really a beautiful morning with the snow and all. And so I want to welcome each and every one of you here this morning to worship together as a community, as a body of believers. We uh, come together to honor the Lord. I'm going to begin just with uh, some announcements, and uh, then we'll go from there. First of all, we want to just apologize. Last Sunday, I know it was a bit cold in here. Perhaps some of you had some icicles hanging from your ears and nose and all of that. We installed some new uh, heating units, and so the uh, thermostats, I think, are in some different places now, and so we're just trying to... Um, figure out how to make that all work. So this morning, I think the uh, temperatures have been set up a bit higher, but we're still in the midst of trying to uh, understand how that all works. But uh, just so you know that we're trying to get you and keep you as comfortable as possible. And so uh, again, um, your feedback would be greatly appreciated uh, in trying to help find a, a proper level of comfort for all of us. So today, the, uh, the children will be uh, in here for worship. You'll be dismissed uh, during the message. So children, you'll stay in here for worship. And uh, just a reminder, uh, the Oasis Spring Conference dates are April the 26th through the 28th. So mark your calendars for that. Uh, a special event coming up for all of us here, April the 26th through the 28th. Also, there is a, uh, an Oasis business seminar. Uh, we had that date earlier for this spring, but we moved it to the month of June, uh, June the 22nd. And this is a seminar for um, business owners, entrepreneurs, uh, those kinds of things. So mark your calendars, and uh, we'll be having more information in the coming weeks um, as that goes along. And so, also... This week, the uh, family of the week is George and Mary Bear. George and Mary, if you would want to make your way up here, um, are you okay with coming up the steps and standing here? Okay? All right. And so, uh, as they're making their way up here, um, I believe that George and Mary, you're some of our, our oldest members here. And so, yeah, why don't we stand, just stand up here, and uh, that way we can, you can face the, uh, the, uh, the congregation. And what an honor to uh, introduce, I think, one of the oldest members in our church here. And so it's, it's a real honor and a pleasure to do that. And so uh, just a few things here about George and Mary and where they were born and raised. Uh, George was born and raised in Delphos, Ohio. I did not know that. And uh, that's way out in western, western Ohio. And uh, Mary was born and raised right here in Holmes County in the uh, Bunker Hill, Berlin area. And uh, where they currently reside is right over here on Cherry Ridge Road, only a couple miles from the church here. And so that's where they currently live. How long have we been married? We are married 59 years. Now, I'm just, que I, I have a question. How many of you are 58 years or younger? Raise your hands. Wow. That's most of you. They have been married longer than most of you have been alive. That's really something. And uh, they look forward to celebrating their 60th anniversary in August of 2024, and what an example of faithfulness. We thank you for that. And uh, yes, let's honor them. Amen. Thank you. We have four children, one girl, three boys. They're all married. We have 10 grandchildren ranging in the ages from 8 to 19 years old. Valerie, their daughter, lives in Goshen, Indiana, where her husband works for Gospel Echoes Prison Ministry. A son, Brent, lives in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. He's on the board and works for Kingdom Channels, a ministry working in Iraq and other Middle Eastern countries. 
A son, Carl, lives in North Canton, Ohio. He owns Castle Bear Design, a graphic design company in Canton. And then also a son, Conrad, lives in Branson, Missouri, where he and his wife are both performers at the Sight and Sound Theaters. Occupation, semi-retired. Uh, we own and manage residential rental properties. Uh, their family motto is our heart's desire and daily prayer is that all our descendants would be in heaven with us throughout eternity. Uh, some of their favorite scriptures, uh, George's favorite scripture is Romans chapter 1, verse 16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power unto God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And Mary's favorite verse is Hosea chapter 6, verse 3. Oh, that we might know the Lord. Let us press on to know him, and he will respond to us as surely as the coming of dawn or the rain of early spring. What brought George and Mary to Oasis was we attended a wedding, and we were impressed with the life we saw. And I just have one question. Whose wedding was that? Oh, okay, Sam and Bretta. Okay, Steve's daughter. Okay, all right. Um, what we appreciate about the Oasis Tabernacle is we appreciate the way that we accept the diversity in people. We also love the community spirit and how people care for each other. Describe one thing that you really like or appreciate about your spouse. So this is Mary and what she likes about George. He's very committed. He's a very committed believer. He is intelligent, a hard worker, <clears throat> very courteous. He was a good example in raising our children and trained our boys to respect women and to be good, honest men. And this is what George um, appreciates about Mary. Her deep commitment to living a Christian life. Also, I appreciate and respect her gentle spirit and her servant's heart. She is very diligent and committed in carrying out her responsibilities in life. A favorite hobby, uh, something they enjoy uh, in life, and they said both are avid readers and enjoy learning. We both like word games. Mary likes working outside, and we both enjoyed traveling when we were younger. What person has marked our lives in the past in a positive way. And George said that my father and mother, Clarence and Mary Bear, they made great effort and sacrifice to raise me and my siblings to be godly men and women. And for Mary, a person that, um, uh, that had a positive impact in her past was my sister Martha. She encouraged me to pursue God and search for truth. Share, uh, just share a brief testimony about their lives. George, George's testimony is, I accepted Christ as my Savior at the age of nine, and at 17 made an adult commitment to Christ. And at age 40, I was ordained to the ministry. And I don't know how many of you knew, but George was a, uh, a pastor for quite a number of years, and uh, he is now retired. But, um, you know, I always... I think the older I get, the more that I just am blessed by men and women who served faithfully in the ministry the way that you have. And so we want to honor you this morning and bless you for, for your years of commitment and hard work and dedication in the Lord's work. Also for Mary, she accepted Christ as her Savior at the age of 11 and made a deep surrender to Christ at the age of 13. Their testimony is that God has not forsaken us, even though we went through some very deep trials and discouragement. We know he answers prayer. We have cried out to God and seen wonderful answers to prayer. And that is their testimony. I was wondering this morning, George, would you be willing to just lead us in prayer and pray for the service? Uh, you've been a minister and a pastor for many, many years, and I'm sure that never leaves you. Even if you're retired, you still sense a burden for that. So would you be willing just here uh, 
as we bring this to a close, would you be willing to just lead the congregation in a prayer? Thank you, Father, for this day. Thank you for your love, your mercy, and your grace. Thank you for the Holy Spirit and your presence in our lives every moment, day or night. Thank you, Lord, for your great love and mercy to us. Thank you for leading Mary and I together, for the children you have given us and the blessing of children and grandchildren. We thank you, Lord. Lord, we thank you for this congregation here. We praise your name that we can be a part of it. Thank you for the love that has been shown to us and the fellowship we have here is really precious. So we pray, Lord, that you would continue to lead and guide and direct each one, help each one to really look to you from whence their help must come. We do thank you for our ministers and their wives. They are a living example for all of us. They are so totally committed. They are sincere in their walk with you, and they're really seeking to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit, and we are so grateful for that, Lord. We pray that you would continue to bless and guide and direct each one of our ministers and their wives. Just guide and direct them, strengthen them, give them courage, and lead them on, Lord, we pray. We just thank you for this day, and we ask all this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Thank you so much, and let's give them another round of applause. Thank you for your faithfulness, and we honor and bless you for that. Thank you. Amen. Just a few words here before we move into um, the worship this morning. I was reading in the book of Revelation, and um, in Revelation chapter 2, I found these words to be, um, to be moving this morning as I was reading, to the angel of the church of Ephesus write, these things says, he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who stands in the midst of the seven golden lampstands, I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have been tested, those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. You have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary." Now, so far, these are all important things to stand for. And the church here at Ephesus had, had labored. They've had patience. They've, they've borne, bore tribulations. They've bore trials. They've labored in his name's sake. But he says, nevertheless, I have this thing against you that you've left your first love. You know, we can be doing many great and good things for the Lord we can be doing and what they were already doing was good. And perhaps we can fall into a trap of doing a lot of things out of duty. Life comes, responsibilities pile up, we have, um, we have pressures, tests, things are due, deadlines are coming up, and we can do all of those things and stay committed and stay faithful. But there's one thing the Lord loves above all of that, and that is to love him, to just love him. And when I read that, I just got this picture of what that maybe might look like. And I remember when the children were just young and some of them were crawling and, and starting to walk and, and uh, there was a lot of commotion, especially in the living room. And sometimes I would just, after work, I'd just lay on the floor and have them crawl all over me and we would just tussle together and we'd laugh and giggle. And um, if, if when I look back, you know, those were some really special times. There was just this connection. There was, we, we didn't, there was no deadlines, there were no door, and just enjoying each other and being together as a family. And you know what? Above all the things that we do in life, that's what God loves the most. 
That's what he loves the most. And uh, maybe we're not rolling around on the floor with the Lord, but you get the picture. He loves that relationship. He loves all of those. And those duties are important. We have responsibilities. We shouldn't neglect them. But above all else, love them. And you see, when we love someone, you can say, I love you, all you want. You can tell your spouse, you can tell your children, you can tell them whatever you want. If you, if you only speak it, but there's nothing, there's no expression of that love. See, your actions will speak far louder than your words. And so this morning, I'm wondering, you know, when we worship and we praise God, if you really truly worship and praise Him, you can't do it without some form of expression. You know, and sometimes we... It's, it's in a quiet, reverent way, perhaps, in prayer. Sometimes it's through the raising or lifting our hands. Sometimes it's through um, all kinds. Of, you know, David, David got so excited in his worship that he twirled enough that some clothes actually fell off. You know? And God liked that. God loved that. Now, I'm glad he had layers of clothing on. But God liked that. There was something about that God said, that's a, that's a man, he's expressing his, his love for me. And so this morning, regardless of what the deadlines, the pressures, the things that you're under, Monday's coming, I know what it feels like to, to have all kinds of deadlines and schedules and people wanting things and the phone starts to ring. It can become very cumbersome, kind of dampen our enthusiasm sometimes. But you know what, this morning, all he wants from you is your love. Can you lavish him with your love this morning in whatever way that is, however you want to express yourself. Love him because the greatest commandment is to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, all of our soul and mind, and then to love our neighbor as ourself. So what does that look like? That may be different. It'll vary from one person to the next but love him with all of your heart, with all of your soul and all of your mind. That is the entire being. That's not just part of you. That's everything. And so I encourage you to love him, to love the Lord your God with all your heart. So I'm going to turn the time to the, uh, to the worship team, and uh, we will enjoy loving the Lord together. Amen? Amen.
something really quick um, before we sing this next song. Um, I don't know if there's anyone else. going through something difficult. I've been going through a really difficult time. But last Sunday I was very convicted that I was running away from God. He showed me in such a gentle way, but I was running away from pain. There was a lot of pain last year for me. Things I don't, I don't want to go through again. And in thinking of this year, you know, coming up and just... Sorry. Thinking of all the difficulties that could be. And just coming to places of surrender again and again and again. But last Sunday when he showed me that, that I'm running from him instead of to him. Because I was scared of what he might lead me through this year. It's just, it's been a week of surrender again, but in a way of running to him instead of from him. And in Psalm 24, it just it keeps coming back to me. Where it says, um, lift up the gates, open the gates, and let the king of glory come in. And I just encourage if there's anyone else that is facing something like that, where you can't even, I couldn't even. couldn't do it on my own but just just to turn myself and run towards him instead of from him made a big difference in my life and I just encourage as we sing this song run to him and not from him
offer in prayer for that. Lord, as we come before you this morning, we thank you. We give you the praise and the glory, Lord, because you're so worthy. And Lord, we thank you for this time. And Lord, I pray as the offering would be passed, Lord, would we, our hearts would be cheerful givers to you and to your kingdom, Lord. We thank you for each and every thing that people give. And Lord, I ask that you would bless each one that puts into the offering. Bless them and keep them in your care. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning. God bless you. I greet you in Jesus' name this morning. And uh, just want to take a quick poll. How many of you are a little warmer this morning than last Sunday? Anybody? How many of you are closer to a comfort level than last Sunday? Some of you are. How many of you need to be warmer than last? Uh, then you still need to be warmer. How many of you are still feeling that? Whew, I'm glad because I was feeling a little warm myself. But anyway... So uh, we'll try to, to equalize things here, but I'm glad. At least you're not needing to go, hopefully won't need to run home and take a hot bath or something to warm up. Um, but we are uh, glad that we do have heating capabilities on cold mornings, and hopefully you'll be comfortable through the service. I do want to dismiss the children for class at this time, and uh, may the Lord bless you as you learn of him in these classes, and may the Lord bless your teachers today. So this morning, I want to uh, speak with you about a subject that uh, actually I started processing quite a number of years ago. Uh, and uh, it, it happened after a prison service in the city of Saskatoon in Saskatchewan, and I, I was uh, struck with a question that I had heard before, but when I got hit with it, just sort of out of the blue at the beginning of a, of a chapel service, I didn't have time to answer it well. And uh, so the title of my message this morning is, Can God Make a Rock? You say, of course he can. He's made everything. There's more to that question, but I want to start by drawing our attention this morning to Jeremiah 32, 17. And it's a statement uh, made by the prophet Jeremiah after, and there's a context to it. Jeremiah had been told by God that Babylonians were going to come and surround Jerusalem. They're going to capture it. They're going to destroy it. They're going to take everybody away. They're going to destroy everything that's there. And then in the middle of this, Jeremiah is in prison. Um, the armies of Babylon are on the outside of Jerusalem. And God says, I want you to purchase a piece of property. 
And so while Jeremiah is in the court of the prison, he purchases a piece of property. He gets a deed that's signed and sealed. And after all of this is done, he says, Ah, Lord God. Verse 17. Behold, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. There is nothing too hard for you. Or I think the King James says there is nothing too difficult for you. And then in Matthew 19, 26, Jesus himself says something similar when he looks at his disciples and he said to them, with men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. And most of us have heard those statements before, haven't we? Nothing is too hard for God. With God all things are possible. It doesn't even really matter what's happening. That's just a comforting thing to know that with God all things are possible. How many times have you tried to comfort yourself or others with those phrases? Well, I was thinking about this, and I remember a children's song that we used to sing. It was, had some motions. I don't remember all of them, but my God is so big, so strong, and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do. And then we'd repeat that, and then there was a little chorus. The mountains are his, are his the, the valleys are his, the rivers are his, the stars are his handiwork too. My God is so big, so strong, and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do. How many of you agree with that? All right. I agree with most of it, except for the last statement. And that's what often gets us in trouble. So I want to talk about that this morning. Can God make a rock? You know, we sing songs, we make statements, often with little thought to the logical conclusions that are drawn from those statements. But there are times that we have lapses in our logic, even as we speak, that leave openings for people to doubt, to create insecurity, because we have these sort of lapses in our logic and even in our understanding. We like catchphrases. As Christians, we enjoy those little phrases that we can just throw out in a conversation. It sounds pious, it should encourage somebody, but sometimes it doesn't. I remember the early years of email. Remember that? When you first got your emails back in, what was it, mid-90s? I mean, maybe some of you were more tech-savvy than that, but I think it was at least 96 or 7 before my wife and I finally got on board with an email. It was a Juno account, and you could... It was so cool because you could dial in any place and get your emails. But one of the things that was a, a kind of a, a marker of those days of early, those early days of emails was that we suddenly discovered that we could forward mails that came, mail that came to us, and we could send them to everybody on our address list. And that was the problem, wasn't it? Because you'd get those emails that put you on a guilt trip. There was something terrible happening at the Supreme Court or in some state house or something that everybody needs to know this. So send this to everybody in your address book. Except for the problem is that many times people who started those either did it on purpose or they didn't check. And a lot of times the story had happened five years earlier. I remember one particularly where I got this urgent email, send it to everybody. And I was like, I'm sick of this. And I said, I started looking and I looked up the issue that was at stake and I realized that it actually had happened five years earlier. It was all said and done. There was, it was taken care of. But what bothered me is that there were a bunch of Christians in my circle of acquaintances that were sending these emails. And I said, you know, this really makes us look stupid. We're not even taking the time to research this a little bit and see if it's true before sending it on. How, how crazy does that make your voice sound in our culture if you're sending around stuff and you've not been careful? You remember those emails? Send it to at least 10. But send it to everybody. It'd be better. Uh, you know those things. And, and if you really love the Lord, you're going to do this, right? We had these guilt trips. Some of you are nodding. You remember those. Some of you are saying, what do you mean? That's, that's crazy. Nobody. Well, that used to be the thing because... It was so much fun to see if we could get these emails forwarded. Anyway, it was a lack of discernment. And it messed with people's witness. 
And I think one of the things that we lack today is discernment. We have a lot of suspicious people. And suspicious people tend to latch on to conspiracies quicker than discerning people. And suspicious people often think they have discernment, but what they really have is fear. And suspicion does not make you discerning. It makes you fearful. So when we get these different things, you're saying, well, John, why are you talking about email? Why are you talking about can God make a rock? Because I'm talking about a problem that we have as Christians where we talk about things and we often don't think before we say it. We, we, we make comments about God. We make comments about doctrine. We make comments about scripture and we often do not take the time to verify that what we're saying is truth. I believe in excellence, and I believe that excellence in the Christian life includes rightly dividing the word of truth, the Bible, and also taking the time to be sure that we are share, what we are sharing with others is not merely hearsay, but is in fact truth. Excellence. I love the fact that in this church, there is a strong emphasis on excellence, sharing the greatness of our God through the way we live, bringing heaven to earth, if you will, in our actions and our attitudes and in our conversation. But I believe that we also need to bring that excellence into how we look at the word, how we study the word, and how we speak about things that we hear. Jesus told Pilate that he had come to bear witness to the truth. And I believe that it's important that we as believers are able to speak knowledgeably and intelligently about matters of truth. So, there's nothing my God cannot do. Is that true? With God, nothing is impossible. Well, how far does that go? So one day I was beginning a Bible study in the Regional Psychiatric Center in Saskatoon and an inmate posed the question, can God make a rock so big that even he cannot move it? Well, I've heard that question before, but I wasn't expecting it that morning and it wasn't really on my radar. And we can all kind of snort and dismiss the question as stupid or mean-spirited or ill-informed, but the fact is, in prison, any question asked by an inmate of an instructor is fair game. Doesn't matter if it's slanted. Doesn't matter if it's, you have to answer it some way. You can't simply dismiss a question without an answer if you wish to retain credibility. And I believe, really, that we all must be, as Christians, should be prepared to answer unfair or slanted questions. We, we need to be ready to give an answer. And you say, John, I don't like to give an answer to that. I think if they're going to ask me that kind of a stupid question, I'll just tell them to buzz off. Well, you can't do that if you want to have an excellent spirit. In cases like that, it didn't work for me to just look at the inmate and say, do your research. That just tells him that I don't have a good explanation. Incidentally, that's usually what it means when we say it to each other. So, in this case, the heart of the question was whether or not God is trustworthy. That's what he was getting at. And just how far does God's power reach? See, that's the heart of the question. It was a question of character and stability, but it was posed as a question that suggested a logical impossibility. But what he really wanted to know is, can I trust God? And can you give me proof that God is trustworthy? So we have Christian catchphrases. The reason he would ask a question like that is we'd say there's nothing God can't do. God can do anything. God can do anything. There's nothing my God cannot do. With God, all things are possible. But they're not totally true. And you say, well, wait a minute, John. Some of those things are actual direct quotes from Scripture. So what's wrong with this? 
If the Bible says so, it must be true. Say, John, are you trying to tell me that the Bible states untruth? No, that's not what I'm saying at all. What I'm getting at is that if we make a statement such as, with God all things are possible, without looking at the context of the statement, we run into the danger of giving people an opportunity to create logical conundrums that are going to roll in their minds and bring doubt. And making statements like this open us up for the question, can God make a rock that is so big that even he can't move it? Well, the statements of Scripture all come in the context of a wider discussion or a a wider writing or reading. We need to be careful about picking out verses and making doctrine out of bits and pieces. So let me demonstrate what I'm talking about with that. Um, uh, For one, there was a, uh, I'm going to share three examples, uh, two that we can look at and point fingers at, and then one that we're kind of guilty of, most of us. So these are two things that happened to me, actually did in um, while I was ministering over the years, one was an ill-prepared Sunday sermon coming out of Mark 10, 24 to 31. And the disciples were astonished at his words, but Jesus answered again and said to them, children, how hard it is for those who trust in riches to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And they were greatly astonished, saying among themselves, who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, with men it is impossible, but not with God, for with God all things are possible. Then Peter began to say to him, see, we have left all and followed you. So in in a Sunday sermon, the man speaking that morning was making a point about missions and going. And he didn't read the part I just read. He just started right there where Peter uh, said to him, see, we have left all and followed you. And so the man begins reading in there, and he, he reads, Peter began to say to him, see, we have left all and followed you. And Jesus answered and said, I, assuredly, I say to you, There is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and the gospels. And he stopped. And he stopped and he made a point about the fact that Jesus said, there is no one who has left everything for the sake of the gospel. And then he began to go on and lament the fact that even when Peter thought he had, Jesus says no one has and how terrible it is that no one has done this How tragic that no one has left all to follow Christ. And I sat there the rest of the service screaming silently to myself, read the next verse. Because it says, who shall not receive a hundredfold now in this time, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions. And in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. You see, he got a point by stopping too early in his reading. He read a verse, and he got a whole point out of that that was not even what Jesus was saying. He made this thing up out of not being willing to follow through. And he never got to the next verse, and I said, that is so elementary. You leave yourself open to so much when you don't read the context, because as he spoke that, there were all of us who had our Bibles open could see that he made a wrong point, that he missed the point of what Jesus was saying because he failed to read the passage. You see, when we take pieces of Scripture out of context, there are plenty who can go look at that and say, that guy doesn't know what he's talking about. He missed the point. She missed the point. So that was one. And I can sit there and look at him and kind of laugh and say, what a, he shouldn't have been preaching. And probably not. But he was nonetheless. And so the next one, The next one was an awkward prison Bible lesson. So I was a volunteer in a Sunday prison service. And and there was another gentleman that was leading the service that Sunday, talking to the inmates. And he was uh, speaking out of John 21, and especially the passage where Jesus has a conversation with Peter on the beach, right? Lovest thou me, you know the story. He did that three times. And 
So then he gets to the part, John 21, 20 to 22, where Peter, turning around, saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following, who also had leaned on his breast at supper and said, Lord, who is the one who betrays you? Peter, seeing him, said to Jesus, but Lord, what about this man? Jesus said to him, if I will that he remain till I come, what is that to you? You follow me. Well, as the prison worker is teaching this lesson, he pointed out that Jesus loved following people. He pointed it out as an idea of Jesus' humility that Jesus didn't just lead, he loved following people. He looks at the verse and it said, Peter turned around and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following and he said, see, Jesus loved following this disciple. This particular disciple, Jesus loved following. Well, then I'm sitting there the rest of the prison service wanting to interrupt him and feeling that it wouldn't be gracious, but I wanted to point out that that is not at all what this text is saying. So in the first situation that I mentioned, the problem could have been cleared up by reading another verse or two. The guy who didn't finish the passage, right? Well, in this situation, in John 21, 20, it does look a little bit like that if you read it. Some say Jesus loved following, and they put a comma after it. The King James puts a semicolon after it. So it looks like it fits in there that Jesus loved following, but that question could have been solved by looking in a couple of other translations and say, is this right? Did Jesus actually love following people? So in the King James Version, John 21, 20 says, Then Peter, turning about, seeth the disciple whom Jesus loved following, which also leaned on his breast at supper and said, Lord, which is he that betrayeth thee? But then the NIV says, Peter turned and saw that disciple whom Jesus loved was following them. Oh, that's a little closer to what seems right. The New English translation say, Peter turned around and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them. The World English Bible says, then Peter turning around saw a disciple following. So the question is, did Jesus love following the disciple John or was a disciple whom Jesus loved following Jesus? It makes all the difference, doesn't it? Context, understanding it. And it's important that we take this. Now, I can look at these two guys and sort of grin and say, well, they just didn't know any better. But what about us when we read the scriptures and give out those fine, cliche answers? So Philippians 4.13 is one of our most loved and most quoted without context verses. It says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I recently saw a meme that says I can do all things through a verse frequently taken out of context. <laughs> Isn't it true? We, we do these things and we, we love it because it's such a powerful statement. Now, it's true that I can do all things through Christ. It really is. But in the context, I can't divorce it from that, from what it means where it's stated. I have to at least understand that statement because if I'm going to apply it to other things, this is not a verse that is without a context. It's not a verse that doesn't, that's just simply out there. It's not just a proverb. It, it has a context and in that statement, it means something. So let me read a broader portion, Philippians 4, 10 to 20. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly now that now at last your care for me has flourished again. Though you surely did care, but you lacked an opportunity. So this is Paul writing to the Philippian church, and he's talking about their care, their, their concern for him, and their provision for him. Not that I speak, verse 11, not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. So Paul says, I've learned how to do those things. In those situations, I, I can be hungry, I can be full. I know how to do both of those well. Now, I don't know. It's tough to do all of those things well. I mean, some of us do better when we're hungry than we do when we're full. And others of us need to be full to be happy, you know. But Paul says, I can be content in either place, right? He says, I, he, he says, I've learned to be in, both to suffer abound, both to be hungry and to, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things, verse 13, through Christ who strengthens me. Nevertheless, 
See, I can do all those things, but nevertheless, you've done well that you shared in my distress. I was hungry, but you've done well that you gave me an abundance. Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving, but you only. For even in Thessalonica you sent aid once and again for my necessities. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. Indeed, I have all and abound, and I am full, having received from Epaphroditus the things sent from you, a sweet-smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Now, there's another one that we often take up and we share it, but realizing the context, Paul is speaking to somebody who has just shared with him, and he is assuring them that even as they may be fearful at having given so generously, God is still going to supply their needs. All right? But these two verses we can often take out of context. So when I look at this, I say it's true that I can do all things through Christ. But when Paul speaks this, he's literally talking about I have learned to be content, and I can be content in all of these things through Christ, who gives me strength. That feels different than the way we apply it so often, but it's coming in that context. Now, does it have a further reach? I believe it does, because in Christ, as we heard, these things are possible. So with Christ, I can do all things. But what are the all things? all things that he has appointed. There's still a context, isn't it? I might want to go out and do a lot of things. So I may try to commandeer Christ's blessing and his presence. But there are some things that I won't have the blessing of Christ for. Even though I think I can do all things through him, there is a context. There is a reach. There is a parameter that goes around that. So let's see what other translations might say. The the Holman Christian Standard Bible says, I'm able to do all things through him who strengthens me. Still, you did well by sharing with me in my hardship. The New Living Translation says, Not that I was ever in need, for I've learned how to be content with whatever I have. I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. I've learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it is with a full stomach or empty, with plenty or little, for I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. Even so, you've done well to share with me in my present difficulty. And the NIV says, I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I've learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry. Whether living in plenty or in want, I can do all of this, through him who gives me strength. So, in light of this, he's saying, John, this is really boring. Why be so technical about this? Well, some of you have asked me, how can I study the Bible? Can I tell you that one of the very simplest ways to begin studying the Bible is to read the whole chapter? When you look at a verse and you want to understand what it means, read the whole chapter. That will really bring context and we'll open a revelation on that verse, all right? So read it in context. One of the easiest, simplest, doesn't even take much time. But take the time to read the context. It will help so much, and it will avoid some of these, as you just saw and probably thought in your mind when I shared them, elementary mistakes. But we make those. And we open ourselves up to questions like the inmate asked. Now, it's, I, want, I want to put one other thing out here. In light of this, that I can do all things through Christ, the opposite is also true. Without Christ, I can do nothing, at least nothing of value in the kingdom. Jesus said in John 15, 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. All right, so if I can do all things through Christ, I need to remember the other side of that is that without Christ... I will not do anything of value in the kingdom. All right. Back to our question of can God make a rock? Jeremiah 32, 17. Ah, Lord God, 
Behold, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. When I look at the context of this, this is a statement where Jeremiah is not necessarily declaring this wonderful declaration of faith. There are, I believe, eight places where this combination of words, ah, Lord God, are found. And they're found in Jeremiah and Ezekiel. And in all of these, Jeremiah or Ezekiel, when they make these comments, they're almost saying, God, are you sure? Ah, Lord God, can it be? You know, Ezekiel does that when he sees visions of people being killed. He's saying, ah, Lord God, are you going to wipe out everybody? It's this cry, almost a gut-wrenching, God, can it be? You know, Burnell preached a couple Sundays ago about building a room, and, and he talked about the Shunammite who, who, who didn't want her hopes raised because they had been dashed so many times. And, and here is Jeremiah. He looks around. He's been prophesying that all of Israel is going to be destroyed, and he's seeing it coming to pass, and now God says, go buy land. Seal it up for many days because they're going to buy and sell land again. And he's saying, God, I, we blew our chance. He goes down and he talks about this. He, right after he says, ah, oh, Lord God, you've made the heavens and the earth by your great power. He talks about all of the things that God has done. He says how, God, you have blessed us so amazingly. You brought us out of Egypt. You led us through the, you brought us into this land. You gave it to us. And then we disobeyed everything. We blew it royally. And now you're coming in and you're saying you're going to destroy all of this. And yet this, now you're saying, I mean, you yourself, God, see that the armies are around us. God, don't raise my hopes. How can it be? We've blown our chance. And maybe you've been there and you feel like you've blown your chance. Maybe you say, all of the things that God has poured into my life and I've just blown it one too many times, God says, listen. Down in about verse 26 of Jeremiah 32, 32, 26. Then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah saying, Behold, I am the Lord, God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? Therefore, thus says the Lord, Behold, I will give this city into the hand of the Chaldeans, into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and he shall take it. And he goes on and he says, all of these things are going to happen. But then, he says in verse 37, after affirming all of the destruction that was coming because of sin, verse 37, Behold, I will gather them out of all the countries where I've driven them in my anger, in my fury and in my great wrath, I will bring them back to this place and I will cause them to dwell safely. They shall be my people and I will be their God. Then I will give them one heart and one way that they may fear me forever for the good of them and their children after them. And then dropping down to verse 43, he continues to talk about the good things. And then he says, and fields will be bought in this land of which you say it is desolate without man or beast. It has been given into the hands of the Chaldeans. Men will buy fields for money, sign deeds, and seal them, and take witnesses in the land of Benjamin and the places around Jerusalem. He says it will happen, but it will happen down the road. I'm holding this out. I'm telling you it will happen again, Jeremiah, but judgment will come. Some of us look at it and we say, man, have we, lo have, have we blown it? Is there any hope? We say, ah, Lord God, can your promises really come true? And God says, yes, they will. They will. There are some things that may have to happen. There may be some natural consequences for the sin. But I still will redeem. I will bring back. I will restore. Nothing is too hard for you, Jeremiah said. And yet at the same time he said it, he was questioning, God, can you really do this? There are times when we make the statement and we say, God, I believe all things are possible with you, even as we look at an impossible situation and we say, I don't know how you're going to do it. But it's okay. Even a prophet like Jeremiah could say, ah, Lord God, you made the heavens, you made the earth by your great power. Nothing is too difficult for you, but this can there really be land bought and sold again? It's destroyed. 
And God says, it will happen. I will bring back. I will restore. Some of you have looked at things that seem like they are hopelessly out of reach in your lives. And you might be at that point where you're saying, ah, Lord God, do you even care about my marriage? Do you even care about my child? Do you even care about my business? Do you even care about... God says, I am the Lord God. Is anything too difficult for me? Is anything too hard for me? And then we look at Matthew 19, 26, where Jesus looked at them and said to them, with men, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. Do you know what Jesus was talking about when he said that? He had just told them that it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples said, well, that's impossible. Who can be saved? And then Jesus said, with man, this is impossible. With God, all things are possible. So with God, all things are possible. So Christians, in trying to summarize God and his abilities, often make that flippant statement that God can do anything. There's nothing he can't do. And it sounds great on the surface but it begins to run into a few logical problems. First of all, we know that God cannot sin. Pretty basic, right? Well, yeah, John, but I wasn't talking about that. I, no, you, when we say there's nothing God can't do, we leave open some of these parameters. There, there are some things that God can't do. Because God cannot sin, there are suddenly great quantities of things God either cannot or will not do. So it becomes a bit of a shallow statement to say that God can do anything without being prepared to contextualize that statement. And I think what most people are believing or thinking when they make a statement like God can do anything or there's nothing that God can't do is they have this context in their mind that there's no circumstance or situation that is beyond God's reach or control. But it's not stated in that context. We have this context and we state it and it can be open for a lot of things. However, when a Christian states this in terms of God can do anything, the skeptic hears something else, namely that the Christian is embracing a logical impossibility and that they don't even realize it. And there's something about that apparent carelessness on the part of Christians that invites skeptics to mock God and poke fun at him. And I think that the, the, the whole point of a question like, can God make a, a rock so big that even he can't move it, is just to point out the logical fallacy about God doing anything. Because even the most skeptical person understands that God, if there is a God, has standards, purpose, design, goals, and will not simply do anything. So, let me tell you a little bit more about that inmate asking me the question. And, and so it was, I was just beginning the study for the day, and I, I wanted to give the inmates a chance to just sort of warm up to the day. And so I asked them what was on their minds. And this inmate was a guy, and I always, I, I learned too little too late to, to be wary of these guys that just show up one time. And this was the first time I had seen him. And I said, so what's on your hearts today? What are you pondering? And with a smirk, he immediately asked the question, hey, can God make a rock that's so big even he can't move it? So I answered that whether God could or not, God probably would not do it, so he replied with a big grin, so God is not all-powerful then, is he? I said, well, God is wise, and making such an object would undoubtedly be against his wisdom and knowledge. Well, he suddenly got up and left the chapel before we could continue the discussion because he had another place he needed to be, or so he said. I, I don't think I convinced, convinced him, but I wished he would have stayed around a little longer and I wish that I had been prepared to speak a little more pointedly to that thing, that question. I wish that I would have been ready to immediately tell him that sure enough, there are things God can't do. And there are things that God won't do. 
Because the Bible tells us so. God has already told us so. He's told us where his lines are. God cannot do certain things, and I would have liked to ask him what things he thought God couldn't do. So, this morning I want to look at several things God can't do. All right? If we're asking if he can make a rock that's so big that even he can't move it, and the whole point is, can God do anything? Let's talk about the things God cannot do. So, God cannot lie. In Titus 1-2, we read, In the hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised before time began. So he, he gives this description of God as a God who cannot lie. I know there's a further context to that, and I would encourage you to look that up. That's a great passage to read. And then we have Numbers 23, 19 to 20. And, and this is actually Balaam speaking. The, the false prophet who, who was speaking, and he said, God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. Has he said, and will he not do? Or has he spoken, and will he not make it good? Behold, I have received a command to bless. He has blessed, and I cannot reverse it. And then there's Hebrews chapter 6, verses 17 and 18. Thus, God, determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of the promise, the immutability, that means the total truth of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, with God all things are possible, right? No, it's impossible for God to lie. Understand that with these things there are if it's not readily evident in the scripture passage we read it, it is readily evident in another part of scripture. And always be ready to compare scripture with scripture as you study the word. Because we just read here that it's impossible for God to lie, but then we read Jesus say, with God all things are possible. See, there's, there's some nuance and there's some context to what he's saying. Be aware of that. Because God will not lie. He has made that very clear. And it's, it's, it's because he doesn't lie and he doesn't change and he fulfills his promises that we can have hope in this world. Imagine if God did lie. Imagine if all things were truly possible and it was possible for God to lie. That'd be pretty distressing, wouldn't it? Because you'd never know when he was telling the truth. But our God speaks truth. And when he gives us a promise, we can depend on it. Isn't that glorious? It's impossible for him to lie. Aren't you glad there are some things that God can't do? I'm grateful. God cannot be tempted with evil, James 1.13. Let no one say when he is tempted, I'm tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. God cannot be tempted with evil. Aren't you glad? There is nothing evil that will make God look at it and say, boy, that looks like fun. I'd like to do that. No. All evil is abhorrent. God cannot be tempted with evil. Something that cannot happen. Whatever God does is good. It is done with good purpose to a good end. God cannot be tempted with evil. Bless the Lord for that. God cannot deny himself. That's another one. 2 Timothy 2.13. If we are faith, faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. This is part of a larger little, um, little rhyme about God and his person. But it ends with saying, if we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. God will not deny himself. In fact, Jesus, the very thing that gets him condemned by the high priest is when in Matthew 26, 62 to 65, the high priest arose and said to him, do you answer nothing? What is it these men testify against you? And Jesus had been not saying anything against all of the accusations that had come his way. They had accused him of all this, that, and the other. And Jesus kept silent. 
The high priest answered and said to him, I put you under oath by the living God. Now notice what he says. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Here is the moment that Jesus opens his mouth. He cannot deny himself. And Jesus said to him, it is as you said, nevertheless, I say to you, hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power coming on the clouds of heaven. He gives him a full answer saying, not only am I the Son of God, but you're going to see me coming in clouds. I am the Messiah. He cannot deny himself. And so what are some things God can't do? God can't sin. God can't be tempted with sin. God can't lie. And God cannot deny himself. But all of these things are distinctly what makes him God. These are the things that make us just shout for joy because he won't change. I mean, there is something so beautiful about that holiness where God cannot do these things. I love it. And that's what makes him, that's, that's part of the character that makes him God. And then God cannot overlook sin. Romans 6.23 says, The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Uh, sin will be paid for. Sin will be dealt with. It is either dealt with in judgment on us, or it is dealt with judgment in Christ. And in this life, we have an opportunity to receive grace and mercy from God because by confessing our sins and trusting in Christ, we have forgiveness and the judgment for our sins falls on Christ. But if our sins follow after us into judgment, that is where we bear the brunt of our sins. Sin will be punished. All of the injustice, all of the things we've been seeing in the news around the world where there, is, there are hostages, where there are, are torture, where there is all of this brutal stuff going on, that sin will all be brought to account at some point before God. Because God cannot overlook sin. It started way back in the beginning, and I'm going to read a, a fairly large portion, Genesis 3, 14 to 19, because this is so important. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle, more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. Sin cannot be overlooked. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed, and he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you. And then to Adam he said, Because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth to you, and you shall eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread until you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you shall return. From the very beginning, God did not overlook sin. And he doesn't overlook sin today. Isaiah 53, verses 6 and 10. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. You see, sin has to be dealt with. God cannot overlook it. God, can't, God doesn't just look at us and say, oh, that's okay. I know you didn't mean it. No, every one of those sins was placed on his son. So God cannot overlook sin. Verse 10 says, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to, to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, whose sin? My sin. Your sin. He shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Another thing that God can't do is he can't make another way of salvation. In Mark 14, 36... Jesus, praying in the garden, says, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. I really believe that if there was another way, God would have done it, but there is no other way. Those who would want another way are simply not wanting to submit to Jesus 
Acts 4.12, nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Or how about John 14.6? This is one that we like to quote often. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And then there's 1 John 5.11 and 12. And this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. It's just that simple. God will not make another way of salvation. It is through his son. Other than that, it's judgment. Through his son. Now, there are some, that, those were things God cannot do. Here are some things God will not do. And these, again, are based on his character. God will not give his glory to another person or being. Isaiah 48, 11, For my own sake, my own sake, I will do it. For how should my name be profaned? I will not give my glory to another. And God's righteousness will not be abolished. Isaiah 51, 6, Lift up your eyes to the heavens and look on the earth beneath, for the heavens will vanish away like smoke. The earth will grow old like a garment, and those who dwell on it will die in like manner, but my salvation will be forever and my righteousness will not be abolished. God will always be righteous. He will never cease to be righteous. It's impossible for God to be wrong. That's what righteous is, right? It's being right. God will always be right, righteous. God will always speak what is right. God will always do what is right. God will always, his character will always be righteous. He is holy. He is set apart. He will not be mocked. So God will not lose his righteousness. And God will not forget his people. Isaiah 49, 15, can a woman forget her nursing child and not have compassion on the son of her womb? Surely they may forget Yet I will not forget you. Now, this is in the context of a promise to the nation of Israel. And friends, God has an eternal promise and an eternal purpose in the nation of Israel. If Jeremiah could have looked ahead and seen the return of Israel in our modern day, he would have been amazed. Because again, land is bought and sold. Again, it is occupied. Again, God's people have been brought back. But God says, I will not forget you. And he says this to the nation of Israel. And that promise to the nation of Israel still stands today. God will not forget his people. I think that's part of what's missing in a lot of our world politics today is we, we miss the fact that God has a special purpose and a plan for them. But then he also gives a similar promise to those who are grafted into this spiritual tree, to the spiritual Israel. Hebrews 13, 5, let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. God will not forget his people. If you've been saying, man, I've been serving God and God, you just seem like you've, I just think you don't even know where I am. Don't believe it. God will never forget his people. God knows where you are. God knows what you're going through today. God knows what you're struggling with. God knows if, if you are feeling like you want to run from him, as Monica was sharing this morning. I mean, this, this thing of a new year, and we look at the world around us, and we're scared of what might happen. But God will never forget his people. He will not forsake his people. God won't do that. That's one of those things he will not do. So here we have the things that God tells us that he cannot and will not do. Since the Bible bears witness that God cannot lie or be untrue to his character, we know that the things God has said that he will not do are as sure as the things that he cannot do. All of these things are connected to his character. These are real because they are who God is. God is holy. God will never be somebody who is wishy-washy, who will be one thing today, say one thing today, and another thing tomorrow, who will, who will just play a little joke to, to see how we respond. God doesn't do that. God is holy. 
He will never be spiteful. The things God does always flow from his holiness. He will not do things from pride or selfish ambition. The things that God does are consistently for the good of his creation and will not detract from his glory. All that God does flows from his character, who he is. He will not do silly or foolish things because they are not of his character. Making a rock that is so big that even he can't move it wouldn't prove anything, would it? Other than that the being who would do such a thing is maybe not God because it would be out of character for God. God doesn't do anything that is not in line with his character. Psalm 102, 25 to 27 says this, Of old you laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you will endure. Yes, they will all grow old like a garment. Like a cloak, you will change them, and they will be changed. But you are the same, and your years have no end. So, considering this idea of an object that is so big that even God himself couldn't move it. God is not only omnipotent, all-powerful, but God is also omniscient, meaning he has all knowledge and he has all wisdom. So if God were to make such an object in line with his character, he would know exactly where to position that so it need never be moved. And so it would always bring glory to his name. Now, I don't believe that God will do that. I mean, we can look at space. We can look at bodies that are out in space that are bigger than we can even really fully calculate. And put it this way, if there was such an object, we may not even be able to see it because it would have to be so far out there. God, God is so big, so powerful, he's made everything. To, to actually put a challenge to God like that and say, I bet you can't do it, is ridiculous. Because if God would just say, our breath is gone. <laughs> there, these are things that I believe sometimes we feel like, oh my goodness, what do I tell this person? He's going to mock God. No, you can't mock God and get away with it. And you and I don't need to worry because God is all wise. Why would he make something like that? What we need to start doing is getting ourselves anchored in his word and say, you know what? Yeah, you're right. There are some things God can't do. But it's based on his character. It's based on who he, who he is. And if he would do those things, he would cease to be God. He can't cease to be God because he is God. I am that I am. He is. He always is. He always will be. If you want to put it that way, it's, it's hard to do that because he exists in eternity. So he always is. But we don't need to worry. If there was such an object that could be made, be assured that it would bring glory to God. It would never need to be moved. It would be solid as the character of God. Well, there's more that could be said this morning on this subject. I've probably confused you enough in, in all of these different uh, places. Hopefully I've given you something to consider because... Friends, here's, here's what my main concern is. We have too often operated out of fear. We don't want to speak too much to the things of God. That's why we use these little cliches. That's why we use these little catchphrases. Because we, we want to stay with things that we think are tried and true. We're afraid to open ourselves up or to look because we're not quite certain. And so we become quiet. We don't want to embarrass ourselves. We don't want others to mock our beliefs. So I speak about this today because I look at this and I say, if somebody ever comes up to you and asks you a question like, can God make a rock? You have something to go back to and, and talk about and say, no. There are just some things that God won't do. They are not consistent with his character. Because, see, there was a day when Jesus himself was tempted to do something with a rock and that was to turn it into bread. And what did he say? Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Did you know that that is true in more ways than just of manna? 
When we hear Jesus say man lives on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, we kind of tend to think, oh, that's spiritual. He was thinking of uh, the the Torah and and whatever. But if you think about Genesis chapter 1, we read that God said and God saw. God said, let there be light. God said, let's separate water from dry land and from sky and all of these things, and it was so. And then God said, let, the, let animals and things come on the earth, let the sea be filled with sea creatures and stuff. Do you know that every time you reel in a fish, you're reeling in the word of God. That fish exists because God said. Every time we eat steak or toss a salad, man's not living by bread alone. Those cows were created by the word of God. You say, but John, it's been many years since those first cows. These are Peter says that God sustains this world by the word of his power. You see, when God speaks, God speaks practical things into existence. Even in your business, even in your family, God speaks and those things happen. Man doesn't just simply live by what he can produce. Pastor Wayne has taught us that. It's not by the sweat of your brow. Man was told he was going to eat by the sweat of his brow. God says you're not going to live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. It's not what I can do, it's what he can do. And when he speaks into my life and into my situation... Believe me, it's practical. I mean, good grief. If he can speak things like fish into existence, if he can speak cows and dogs and cats and things into existence simply by telling the earth to be populated with them, what brought it out? It was the Word, the Word of God. So man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. You and I breathe by the breath of God. Our lives. But when Israel was in the wilderness, guess what they had to do? They had to wander. And it said God humbled them by making them hungry. He ran them out of their own resources. And then he fed them manna. It was something that they had not known. They had no place to file it other than this is God's provision. You know what? Some of us need a little bit of God's provision today. There may be a lot of God's provision. There are some of us who have been working and trying to produce all that we can on our own. We've been working by the sweat of our brow. We've been doing all of these things. We might get sidetracked by, can God make a rock? But let me tell you, God speaks. And when he speaks, he speaks practical things. And so God made Israel hungry So they would cry out to him. And God gave them, in Psalm 78, it says he gave them angel's food. Not an angel food cake, but angel's food. He gave them something they had not known. Something they could not produce on their own. And maybe it's time in your relationship, in your business, in your family, in other relationships, to ask the Lord for something that you cannot produce. To speak life into that situation. To speak and bring his power to bear. I'm going to invite the worship team to come forward and I'm going to wrap up with two points. I've asked the question, can God make a rock? And I want to answer that question and say God has made a rock, a rock that we cannot avoid. He describes the effect of this rock in Daniel 2, 34 uh, 34 to 35. He says, and it's it's in a dream that Nebuchadnezzar had, and Daniel interpreted this. He said, you watched while a stone was cut out without hands, which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed together and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. 
The wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found, and the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Inasmuch as you saw that the stone was cut out, this is verse 45, inasmuch as you saw that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands and that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, the gold, the great God has made known to the king what will come to pass after this. The dream is certain and its interpretation is sure. God made a rock. His name is Jesus. And that rock, there will be a day when we hear the words, the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. And he shall reign forever and ever. He is the rock. And Jesus identified the rock in Matthew 21, 42 to 44. He said this, Have you never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation bearing the fruits of it. And whoever falls on this stone will be broken, but on whomever it falls, it will grind him to powder. God has made a rock. It's not a rock that he can't move, but it's a rock that we can't move. It's a rock that is a stone of stumbling for us. It's a rock of offense. He is a rock of offense. It is why a skeptic would cry out and say, can God make a rock that he can't move? No, God can make a rock that you can't move. And the reality is that if you don't fall on that rock and allow him to break you, that rock will fall on you and crush you. If you don't allow that rock whose name is Jesus, to break you, to humble your heart, to cause you to repent of your sins. There will be a day when that rock will fall on you. There will be a day when men will cry out to the mountains and rocks of the earth to fall on them, to hide them from the face of the rock, Christ Jesus, to hide them from the face of the judgment that will come. The question is for us this morning is not so important whether God can make a rock that he can't move, but to acknowledge the rock that we can't move, the rock Christ Jesus. And he calls you, he invites you today, he invites me today to repent, to turn to him, to stop doing my own thing, to fall on his mercy. Because today is the day of salvation. Today is the day of mercy. If I'm harboring sin in my heart, There will be a day when I will look at that mountain, that rock, and I will look for any place to hide. But if I have fallen and allowed that rock to break me, to shape me, to mold me today, to take my iniquity, I don't need to fear. So where are we today? Can God make a rock? He can. He has. The rock is Christ Jesus. Let's fall on him for mercy this morning. Let's plead his grace. Let's ask for his every word in our hearts. God bless you, worship team.
Hallelujah. Thank you, Brother John. Where are you? Thank you for all your studies on that. Can God make a rock that he can't move? You know, what I think when I think about that is a foolish man trying to outthink God. It's a little bit the way that I used to think. I wonder where God came from. You know what it tells me in the answer of that? Where did God start? That tells me how limited I am. I don't even know. God is eternal. He's always been. I don't understand that. That tells you a little bit of my mind. And, and this man that asked this question, I was thinking about this. How could we even think? Could God make a rock that he can't move when you look at all universe and all stars and all that's all rock. The earth is a rock. God is not man, and I'm so glad he is not. But one thing that I do know, and then also going back to restoration, God is about restoring. And he's, he's not a God that tries to outbuild himself. I don't think that's possible. But there are things that God cannot do and will not do. And I think you brought it out so clearly. It's so much of his character base in this. We also see that God is not foolish. He's not that. But that God cannot lie. You know, one of the reasons and the logic behind why he can't lie is because everything he says becomes. It becomes that. How do you deal with that? Let there be light. Boom! There was light. I'll make no light. Boom! There it goes. It becomes what he says. And I think that in our understanding of God is so little. And you know, down through the eternities coming, when we can be with him and have the expanded understanding of maybe a portion of who our God really is. Because we know that when he took this hardened rock that we were and he changed it in such a fashionable way into his image and glory so that now we long for him and we love him and we do all our things based on who he is and how we yearn after him. Every day, all of you, every day, you're constantly thinking, you think about God, you pray to God, you ask God, you speak to God. Something, somewhere, your God did something in you that caused that drawing. Hallelujah. Amen. And he will always do that. One thing that we know that God does is a verse that went through my mind, that I will restore unto you the years that the canker worm and the palmer worm and the caterpillar has eaten. Maybe a little bit of what Monica was saying. You know, we go through times when we want to just draw away from God because We've given our lives to him in such a depth that he may do whatever he wishes to with us. Remember when you made a commitment like that? Is there anyone else that did that? Yeah. You know what he does is he will tear down and he'll build up. And in the tear down of our character and nature sometimes, it hurts so much. And it's like, there's times that I've experienced God, I'm just tired of you working in me to make me less because it's painful. It hurts. But the end is never that. The end is restoration. God often will not do things unless he tears away first. And we have to remember that. Because we are a proud individual of our own nature. And we are a self-made people. And for God to build on to that, often he has to tear away. Look at a house. You tear down, tear away walls. And if you could hear the, the house speak, it would say, what in the world are you doing with me? You're tearing down this room that was so useful. You're tearing down this plaster, in some cases, but drywall that was put there so strategically for reasons. And now this is being torn down. What are you doing? Serve I no more purpose in life. And this is somewhat what man goes through when God starts dealing with us. But it's because we gave ourselves to him. That's why he may deal. And God, you may deal that. 
We know it's painful, but you always have something in mind, and that is restoration and better. Better our character, better our thinking, more into his thoughts and so forth. This is really how God works. He doesn't neglect us. He doesn't look the other way. Yes, there is times he allows us to feel that. That God, where in the world are you? I think you've left me. What have I done that I don't sense your mercy on me? That's part of his making. But he has never left us or forsaken us. And sooner or later, you will arrive at that point again and you'll say that. I've walked with God for many years. And there's many times that I just know God has forsaken me because he's looking the other way. He doesn't really care while I'm going through very deep times. But my conclusion is, after I wait on the Lord, my strength is renewed, is that he never leaves me nor forsakes me. That is my conclusion. It is my conclusion. And yours will be same. Father, we thank you for the message today and your glorious word and the power of who you are. God, we have such a, we don't even have an opinion of you. You're far bigger than an opinion. You are God. You're a holy God. You're the ancient of days. I don't know, but I know that my hair are white. And I know what has caused them to be white. But then I also know that in Revelation we read that your hair are white as well. But you go through the eternities and eternities and eternities of stories and things and things that we have no idea about. It is because of your greatness. And somehow, we also would understand that you have faced difficult times when you have. When it was in heaven for one of those beautiful angels that you had created turned on you and you had to throw him out. And a third of the angels that were created went right along with that. There was devastation. There was war in heaven. The Bible says that. War is not pleasant. So I don't know that we understand so much about you, Lord. But when we look at our own lives and we see how you deal with us, we have an understanding of your interests. And we conclude, you will never leave us and you will never forsake us. But as long as we're here, you're always creating and developing your image and your likeness in us. Thank you, O oh Father, for that. And this happens through the power of the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord, for those moments of times when we have knelt before you in tears and we gave our life even deeper to you to do whatever you choose. And we forget at times that we did that and then it hurts so bad. But then... A couple words come out of the mouth, out of the lips, and it ministers to so many. This is part of what it looks like to carry rivers of living water. Hallelujah, Lord. You told us this. Out of our bellies will flow rivers of living water. This is what it looks like. We thank you. Thank you, God, for your love and your goodness, for your mercy and your understanding on us. We love you. Our life surrounds you. We enthrone you. We think of you all the day long. And when we wake up at night, our thoughts go to heaven. Thank you, Jesus. You are our Savior. Be with us this week as we go forward, that your name would be exalted. Give us safety. Grant us your pleasure, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You're dismissed.